Hey everybody, welcome to In a Lit Chat on Air. I'm your host, Dave Arney. Uh, tonight is the first night of a brand new format that we're going to be using uh, maybe every two weeks or so, so we'll see how it goes. The goal tonight is to be very, very interactive with you guys out there on Twitter. So if you are not on Twitter, you definitely want to jump on Twitter, use the hashtag In a Lit Chat, and uh, you'll be able to communicate with us. We're going to be looking for suggestions on really great first lines. We're going to be having a first line, a best first, sorry, a best worst first line contest. And then like we did with covers, if you'd like to get a little bit of advice or a little bit of a critique on any of the first lines or book blurbs that you're working on right now, you can uh, tweet those links. On Twitter tonight is going to be Mr. EJ Wesley. You can go ahead and send him anything. And if you have any questions for us on air, you can put a big Q in front of that. If you have something that you'd like us to pull up on screen and show off, uh, any good news and like that kind of stuff, go ahead and throw it up there as well. But tonight we have uh, a very special old old guest, actually our very first guest from the very first live broadcast we ever did, the Super Chat, where we got the NA Alley blog and the Google Plus community together. Um, so I'd like to welcome back Mr. Chris Fox. Chris, how are you doing? Doing good. How are you? Uh, you know, I'm doing pretty well. We do this every week, and every week we're like, man, we wish Chris would come back. We wish Chris would come back. And then last week, Chris was like, hey, I'm back. So what have you done? Like, what's what's been the what's been your life for the last four or five months since we got to hear you on air last? A lot of working, a lot of writing, and I'm trying to put it. I put out more content for my series, and thankfully, besides Amazon being annoying, it's working out pretty well. Oh, we'll have to get it back to Amazon being annoying in a second. We are always interested in annoying Amazon. Um, now, you graduated with an English degree, right? Yes, sir. And you are doing editing currently, or not doing editing currently? Uh, I mostly just edit for myself, um, just because I keep myself so busy. But like. Uh, it's not like I work for anyone, but for friends or people who need it, yeah, I'll edit a little bit. Okay, cool. Yeah, we're, one of the things we try and do, of course, is have indie resources out there, and um, Chris has been working with New Adult for quite a while now, and his series is actually probably one of the, um, the leaders in the non-romance category of New Adult literature, and I know that we're going to be putting some spec fiction nights together again, so hopefully we'll get him back for that. My co-host for the evening is, of course, Miss Avi Evans. Avi, how's it going? How's your life been? Everything's great. How are you, David? I'm doing well. It's nice to have you back. I know that you had some holidays and some families and some stuff. How did all that end up for you? It's always exciting. September is a busy time of year. I'm pretty psyched that it's October because now the leaves change and we're done with all that fun stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's very good, and we're, we're glad to have you on air. Um, if you are joining us for the very first time, um, welcome. And we always like to give at the top of the hour a definition of new adult. And actually, I usually do it, but I wanted to ask Chris, because um, you've been working with it for a while now, too. What's your quick one-sentence pitch on what new adult literature is all about? New adult will have to be literature that's made for a older audience, but not quite for adults yet, for people who need that young adult voice with a little bit something extra. Ooh, I like that. And I like that you pulled out the young adult voice. I don't think we emphasize that enough because I do think that's the beauty of what we're doing is taking that voice but growing the content and growing the age a little bit together. Um, so thank you for that. And, of course, if you're joining us for the first time, if you like to listen on audio, you can. If you'd like to join us on Twitter, you can. And, of course, if you want to have both going at the same time, we'll have some pretty pictures later on for you. Uh, none of those gifts, though. I'm sorry. Uh, too, Chelsea, you'll have to just keep that under control tonight. Uh, oh, joining us is our Hangout producer for the evening is Ms. Lycan Craig. And, Lycan, what's the news? What's going on on Twitter? Gosh, we've got a lot going on tonight. Let's see. K.K. Hinden says that she has a giveaway going on on her website, and I earlier tweeted out the link into the uh, Twitter feed for any lit chat. So any of you interested in going and looking at her giveaway on her blog, do that. We have um, Seth S. Fishman says, writers under contract might want to check out uh, a place to work online. It's at theatlanticwire.com, and I also tweeted out that link for everyone. Lauren Kleinman is starting editing draft three of This Way to Forever. Um, 2582 words in and 35K to go. So she's almost halfway mm, there. Congratulations. Good. Yeah, way to go. I hope we've given her some good good pointers the last couple of weeks to do that with. Uh, KK Hinden also says a cover reveal today and an eARC giveaway, and that's also on her blog and uh, the the link that I earlier tweeted out. <laughs> L.K. Lewis uh, has a joke of the day for everyone. 
Past, present, and future walked into a bar. It was tense. <laughs> ah. That's a groaner. That's a groaner. <laughs> that is a great groaner. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I, I like it. <laughs> Kat, who is often with us here, uh, says that she hit the 50% complete with her current work in progress. So that's good. I know she was working hard last week on it. We have a few news items everybody would want to know about. Um, Narrative Magazine is offering an internship opportunity, um, and we have a link for that. I can tweet that out too, although, you know, it's an awfully long one, so I don't know if it'll work. But if it, anybody wants that, get in touch with me, and I can surely uh, direct you to that. It's Narrative Magazine, and the announcement was on um, the blog Donahole, D O N N. A H O L E dot blogspot dot com, and this was for posted Monday, September thirtieth. Narrative Magazine wants an intern, and it looks like a good opportunity for someone that's looking for that kind of a situation. It's online, so you wouldn't have to be physically where the magazine is. In a alley, is putting out an announcement as of today that they're compiling a list of fall and winter new adult reads. And if you as an author would like your book on that list, you need to get in touch with them as soon as possible and have your book listed. They're looking for books that are non-contemporary, not because they don't like contemporary, but because they have so much contemporary listed that they thought they'd make a special um, mention of getting books in that are not contemporary. Um, they're looking for, especially for the month of October, paranormal romance, horror, science fiction, dystopian um, that kind of a genre. And again, this is for their fall and winter list. And if you're interested, go to the NA Alley blog. That's www.naalley.com. And you can get more information on that. And that's about it. Cool. And I, I brought up uh, the, the cover reveal that we had earlier, so we can kind of all gaze at that. Amy, uh, what do you think of this cover? I think it's it's hot. It's totally NA. I, uh, I think that. Personally, I have a cover reveal coming up, and I've been in all the beach pictures, and I didn't see that one. So I think that that one looks like a really nice combination of, of really sweet and kind of thoughtful. So I don't know what the book's about. I'd love to see the blurb. I love the retro. I'm into it. Yeah, I, love I really love the retro. I really yeah. love the retro. And I, I love the thing that I'm kind of obsessed with lately with covers is, is being able to pull out separate parts because it's it's kind of infrequent that online you actually get to show the entire shape of the cover. When you think about it, if you're using it in, you know, your Twitter icon or uh, different sizes on people's blogs. So she's done that really nicely. She's got the image at the bottom separated from the style of the title at the top, and she can use both parts if she needs them. Now, David, wait. Oh, yeah, good, like we have one more news item that came in just now. Go for it, uh, yeah. Deanna Altomara says this is the one month anniversary of her first book, Ageless. That's cool. Woo. He's excited about that. Congratulations. Yay. Um, I was actually just going to talk to Chris for a second because, Chris, I forget which side of the debate you came down on last week with the people on cover versus not people on the cover. Um, here's an example of a person on the cover, but we've kind of got the face turned. What do you think of that in that respect in relation to that argument that we were kind of uh, joyfully having last week? Uh, this is, if there is a person on the cover, this is what I like to see. Not necessarily like, the thing that bothers me about people on the covers is that they're just like all up in your face. It's like, I am the protagonist. You will like me. And it yeah. just feels like uh, an advertisement almost. Like, this is what you're supposed to like. This is how you're supposed to read it. But something like this one for a heart, uh, heart breaths, you get, um, you know, you get a scene rather than a person, even though there is a person on the picture. It doesn't fill in your. It doesn't fill in the blanks exactly as to what the protagonist looks like this way, which is right. a really great strategy. Right, because you're like, oh, here's a girl, so it must be about a girl. But uh, she's on a beach. She's just looking around. What's she doing? And it makes you want to pick it up and read the back to see what she's doing. Yeah. yeah it accomplishes exactly what it does, which is we want to know more. <laughs> Let's I find think out more that, about it. I think that David in his Dean Sage series um, is excellent at that technique, Amy, that you just mentioned, um, doing a book cover where you have a person, but you can't really see their face, or I'm sorry, Chris, you said that, where you can't really see their face clearly. So that kind of caters to both um, camps here, where people 
some people like to see a person on the cover and some people feel that it ruins a little bit of the imagination and the fantasy for them. So if you have a person but you don't have a clear idea of their face, sometimes that works very, very well. And I think that covers a good example of that. I do too, and in general, I agree with you, and I just threw my own rules out the window. I have a cover reveal coming up next week, and I, after a, a long decision-making process, I actually found two cover models that really were the people that were in my head, and I just kind of went for it. And I love the way that it looks, but I'm very aware that this is not, in theory, I prefer to do it the other way. So I'm just kind of, sometimes you have to throw your theories out and go with your gut, so we'll see what happens with this one. Well, there's an interesting question that came up in some of our discussions recently, and that is, what makes new adult this? What makes a cover new adult? What makes an opening sentence new adult? And since we're kind of talking about opening sentences and beginnings and stuff, um, I, I'm kind of curious. Like, do you think that there is a propensity for people? Because that is definitely the case in young adult. In young adult, people on the cover sell better than no people on the cover, um, unless it's a book for boys and it's an action adventure. Those are the two big exceptions. Just you know, looking at the at the stats and the numbers, do you think that's going to hold true for a new adult, Chris? What oh, do you yeah. think? Uh, by marketing terms, probably it will, because you kind of see that same thing spread out across any form. Like, if you pick up a fantasy novel on the adult section, you'll probably see a person on the front, and if you see a children's book in the children's section, just general children's, there's probably a character on the front. So, it sells. So, marketers and people who like that kind of thing will definitely keep doing it, especially for new adults. But uh, it, I think we might start seeing a shift if we start seeing more non-romance, non-contemporary, because there's just we, we don't know what most of the artwork is going to look like when we try to do that. Yeah, when we look to the adult of speculative fiction in particular, it's all over the place. I mean, it just it really just depends on... Uh, and, and there's so many niche parts of all of those categories and genres now um, that the marketing has become almost, you know, Robert Jordan always looks like Robert Jordan and, and H.R. Martin always looks like H.R. Martin and then everybody either imitates them or tries to look completely different. Um, so it's an interesting thing and, and it kind of filters into what we're talking about tonight a little bit. So if you're out there on Twitter, um, start to let us know what you think. You know, what makes a new adult first sentence or a new adult um, book a new adult book and how do you convey that when you get started? Obviously the cover is one big way to do it, but hopefully if the cover works, they pick up that book and they read the first sentence. What does that first sentence got to tell everybody? Does it got to say college? Does it have to say party? What is what does that content need to be in order to be new adult? Um, so that's kind of our, our ongoing question. And then of course, at the end of the night, we'll have um, we'll probably make I don't know Chris pick the best worst first line. So uh, feel free to let your your 140 characters fly and give us the best worst first line for a new adult book out there. Um, and, and then if you'd like us to do any kind of critiques or talk about any of the uh, first lines that you've written or ask some questions, go ahead and tweet those over to EJ. We'll get them up on air and kind of give you our, our best judgment and also get some uh, peer review going on for you as well. I think what we're going to do now is talk a little bit about just first lines. And I, I know that I think everyone knows that they're important and it's really easy to pull out like really good ones and it's really easy to pull out really bad ones. But we've got two editors, well technically me, we've got three. We've got three editors and we've got a marketer in the room. So I think maybe we can start to talk about what makes a first line a first line and what's helpful. And then of course out there on Twitter let us know what's going on. What do you think makes a good first line? Um, I'm going to pull up a list of classic first lines and this one was compiled by Lycan. So Lycan, step us through this real quick. Okay. Um, I'm not sure which one you have first. So uh, Can you see the screen share? Mm. No. Okay. Yes. Have... Yes, I can now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I I really love these because I, as I was telling David and and everyone earlier, they're so um, illustrative of what we were talking about in the week that I did uh, camp for all of you. That you want to have a first line that's eye catching, in the sense that it. It draws the reader in and has the reader asking questions about what's to come. It wants to propel the reader forward. And if you can't do that in your first line, you already have a few strikes against you. I thought these were really good examples. One that I listed in camp was The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. And the first line is, if you really want to hear about it, the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born and what my lousy childhood was like and how my parents were occupied and all before they had me. Oops, I lost it. Uh, I can pick and, it up. And all that David Copperfield kind of crap, but I don't feel like going into it if you know if you want to know the truth. 
Right. And he says a lot. That's all one sentence, folks. And he says a lot in that about what is going on in his mind. You know, you already know who the character is after reading that one sentence. And I think that's just brilliant. Um, Leo Tolstoy, this is from Anna Karenina. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And that says a lot, too, because you know what kind of book you're going to be reading right there. George Orwell's 1984 starts, It was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking 13. One of the most um, famous first lines is from A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. And that tells you a lot about the book you're going to be reading. And I wanted to mention something interesting for writers out there. Um, in that sentence where it says it was a season of light, it was the season of darkness, he has chosen to capitalize the words light and darkness. And, and that's kind of interesting. Hmm. Well, Thank Chris, you, David. Oh, yeah, no problem. Chris, um, do you think that you know, if we had just had the first lines without the authors and, and stuff, would we be able to tell the genre from these? Um, I don't know. What do you think? Uh, it it's hard because technically, you know, all writing is writing. So you could technically find any type of writing in any genre or category of book. I think the one that stands out of those that we read is the J.D. Salinger quote. Not because of what it's saying necessarily, but how it's said. Because, as we all know, the uh, Catcher in the Rye is just so well known for that uh, first person young mm -hmm. voice mm -hmm. that we find all the time in young adult. It's practically the inception of it really, the young yeah. adult voice. It's really, and I think it's actually the inception of new adult in a way because it, if we had followed its example, I don't know that we would have the division between the two categories. I think we would have just had one sort of you know, adolescent category to deal with and then you know, various explorations of it. Because it, if you look at its content, I mean, it's all sort of quote-unquote new adult content level. I don't think a current young adult publisher would ever touch something like that again. Um, but it really is the quintessential young adult voice. So what you're saying is definitely the young adult voice seems to be more apparent in a first sentence, perhaps, than any other category of writing so far. So far, yes. Uh, the, I think getting to the, the larger topic of like what makes that type of sentence a new adult or any other kind of category, uh, not only does it have to say a lot about the character and like their perception of the world, but it also has to evoke a mood, and you want to feel something about the story, not just about the character. So the George Orwell quote goes uh, along with that, and the clock struck 13. 13? What? I don't understand Yeah, that that's a, I love juxtaposition in a first line. Oh my gosh, that, that, yeah, that always gets me. If there's something that sort of makes you go, what? In a good way, um, not in a, it wasn't capitalized or punctuated correctly way, um, <laughs> yes. I'm always a little bit more happy. That's the shortest of the first lines I read, and that one is brilliant. I just think it's brilliant. I'll read it again. It was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking 13. That's it. Now, if I were a publisher or an, or an agent, I would read that, and then I'd read the rest of the page every time. Well, let's take a quick Twitter break. Lycan, I know that there's some cover talk, and then there were some ideas. Uh, there was a couple first lines already offered out there. Um, so yeah. let's bring those on in here and talk about them for a minute. Yes. Um, I uh, tweeted a link to um, P.K. Rizzo, and, and I hope, dear, I'm saying your name right. Her cover reveal is October 16th, and I tweeted a link out to her blog because she's having um, a blog fest on that day, and you can go to her blog and sign up for the cover reveal. So look for that link in the feed there. Um, Minerva Guerra said she, she goes... Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but sometimes our tweet, our feed jumps around here. She goes for the obscured face or profile on a live model, and that's because all her live models are Asian, and I'm not sure why she would obscure the face because they're Asian, but that gives you food for thought. I personally like faces on covers. That was from Kat, and I know a lot of people feel that way. Other people don't like faces on covers at all. We kind of had that discussion last week. 
Um, L.K. Lewis says, first lines make me think of blurred lines, and now that song is in my head. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Lyrics are great examples of good first lines, though. That's yeah. They're always short and sweet. And they they are. The they story. are. Because they have to grab you, too. That's very Absolutely. true. Absolutely. Lauren Kleiman says, covers are so important. Do you, know, do you find yourself wanting to know more about the book based on a cover? And I know I do. Here's a first line. This is from Minerva Escara again. Disclaimer, I'm new at this. Okay, let's I, stop I there. I think that's a really good first line. Yeah, yeah well, let's, let's stop there. So we, we didn't get really anything other than a, a very short kind of, you know, what's going on. Um, Chris, what do you think of that line just as a, as a line? It, it, it's interesting because it stands out. You, oh, new at what? Why, why aren't you telling me what you're new yeah. at? Okay. It, All right. And, and I, it, the, the, what I like about a good first line is, and even going beyond like the mood and the character and all that, I like a hook, something that just is juicy and I want more of. So when you give a vague and abstract type of sentence, as long as it you know is simple at its core but has a larger connection to the story. I'll be definitely interested. I'm like, I want to read the next line, and then mm. the following, and then the book. Okay. Yeah, yeah, there's something to be said about hooking people. Amy, what do you think about uh, the hook versus being too obscure? Amy, are you still with us? Yeah, no, sorry. Okay, the, that the question the over to... Oh, there you are. getting okay. a little jumpy. I'm right here. The sound was getting a little jumpy. I didn't hear you switch right away. Um, I... I personally would want to know a little bit more. I think that the trend that I'm sensing or that I'm seeing a lot of the new adult is a vague first line and then a more descriptive second line that sort of, sort of plants a flag in the sand like and a say, I'm a new adult kind of book. Thing. Exactly. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not, I actually didn't realize I was following a trend. I just did that in my work in progress as well. And I think that, um, I think that people are very conscious of trying to do something that's like short, punchy, and, and almost Twitter speak. And I think that that's something that's very current and uh, it probably works a lot, but it does it does make you have to think of whether or not you want more. Like, did you get enough of the story to want more, or are you better off doing a little bit of a longer first line that's not quite as punchy? Or, or I guess the other part is, do you automatically get 140 characters? So can you fit two sentences in a new first line? Well, that's a good question. I know I, I was saying I saw a couple t cheaters in the feed. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, the way, that, the way that I think I always interpret the first line, like in Chris, correct me, is basically to that first period. The first full stop is yeah. your first line, right? Yeah, that's what I think too. I'm just saying. I'm just questioning now that we're so familiar with like short attention span theater, um, and 140 characters is something that people are so comfortable writing in. I wonder if people are doing the one-two punch and still thinking about that in that sort of. That's a good point. Right. And that actually, well, there's another discussion about does a prologue count as your first line or does your chapter one count as your first line and right. all that kind of stuff we can kind of get into. Like, and throw us out another first line, though. So it's, it's, <laughs> that, you know, that reminds me the the line from Amadeus that there are as many notes as are required in the piece. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, and I actually, Minerva, I really, um, I'm saying Minerva, but that's not her name. I think she, Mina, uh, are we talking about Mina? M M Mina? Yeah, she Mina. says, call me Mina. Sorry, hon. <laughs> but yeah, again, the line is disclaimer, colon, I'm new at this. And I really like it. I think it's a slap in the face, and, and it in a good way. And uh, it got my attention. I, I really commend her on it. We should probably um, point out the title for that was Interim Goddess of Love. Yeah. So now, yeah. Yeah, now, we, now that we have a little context, I actually like that line even better. But what's, what, what's, give us another first line. Who else has got one out there for us? I've Can got he, one for you. Oh, Can go ahead. offered one. Oh, I'm sorry. You go ahead, then I'll go. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Cat offered one. If I told you what was really out there, you would never believe me. Okay. Like All right. For this one, it was Lauren Kleiman. I'm not sure what the book is, but she says, "Someone once told someone once told me everything is fiction, even love." Oh, like okay. Is that now, your that's your one-two punch right there that we were talking exactly, about. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, let's take those. Let's take those two lines separately for one second. So we had the. Um, if I told you what was really out there, you would never believe me. Um, obviously, we have a very good sense of of genre already, uh, or subgenre. Um, we are not necessarily sure if it's you know young adult, new adult. Obviously, the I, you know, the use of the first person clues us in that this is maybe not a standard um, you know action adventure book like we're used to reading. Um, Amy, what do you think about the 
the the the idea, the trope that it's kind of evoking. Did, would that get you? Would that grab you? Um, it would. It would grab me because I like sci-fi paranormal. But I think that if I didn't, I would immediately close up the book. And I think that that's something that a lot of people um, who don't necessarily read those genres will often say. You know. And that's yeah, actually maybe not a to... bad thing. That's maybe not a bad thing. I think the best blurb on the back of the book is the one that gets the right person to pick it up and the wrong person to put it down. I exactly. completely agree. I think it saves everybody time. So in that respect, I, I think that it, it tells you a lot about the story, even though it's technically on the vague side. You know, it's not giving you any kind of specific information, but it tells you what you're in for, and I like that. Now, Chris... I'm going to put you on the spot here because I know that you don't prefer the romance genre, but obviously the line that you read to us probably is cluing us in that this might be a contemporary romance. What do you think about that line, knowing what you know and like and don't like about the category itself? Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't necessarily like romance all the time, but uh, I am a sucker for some good romance, and <laughs> what good romance is is poignant but simple. And uh, for this, someone once told me everything is fiction, period, even love. Uh, it it makes you think again. Well, why is this love fiction? So it, it it just it makes a lot of thoughts. And a good first sentence can either explain a lot or not explain a lot. And for this one, it leaves you kind of in the dark. And that's why you want to keep reading. You it it it's hard to put feelings to that kind of sentence. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. I totally agree. I I really like it. it and. It, 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 it's interesting that Lauren chose to wrote to write it. Someone once told me everything is fiction. Period. Even love. Period. So it's actually two sentences. I really like that she chose to split that into two sentences. I think it gives it more punch. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I love the the use of of the fragment. I love. The, I mean, I, I'm a big big mm-hmm. fan of the fragments. Of arrest, yeah. yeah of arresting the reader based on how you punctuate. Um, yeah. I, I treat it I, maybe too much. I treat it a little bit too much like art sometimes. But I love <laughs> kind of tripping it, tripping you up at the right spot. You know, mm-hmm. not not because it was a mistake I made, but because it was something that was intentional. And that's perfect because it could have been a comment, could have been semicolon, it could have been a colon. You know, could have been a dash. I mean, it could have been a lot of things. But that period really sort of makes you go, okay, this is really sort of important. And I, even though I would call it quote unquote cheating, it's not cheating. I love like we were talking about the one-two punch. I think that's even different than the one-two punch though, because that's just a very well constructed grammatical entity that catches the attention just like it should. And it, that's still a single thought, unlike some of the other one-two punches that we're seeing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're not taking the, some of the other one-two punches. It's it's you know a short phrase, or you know with a period. It's a short phrase with a period, and then it's something that's very descriptive about the book, and that's just sort of more poetic as opposed to descriptive. Yeah, it like opens you in and then kind of explains cuz you want that explanation, but they the people who write that way want to give it to you right away so you're not instantly uninterested because of a vague start. Right. Well, there's an interesting little quick comment discussion that happened on Twitter. Uh, KK um, Hinden was saying that uh, they they don't even uh, think about the first line that they write. They just write. And then Lauren actually responded and said that the first line establishes the voice, that that's what you need to start strong. So kind of kind of contradicting that idea a little bit about not thinking of the first line. And we've, you know, we've got a couple editors in here. Um, when do you think of the first line, and do you agree that it is very important to establish everything that comes after, or can you kind of establish that over the course of the first page? I mean, honestly, what are we dealing with? Chris, what are your thoughts based on your sales, and based on your actions with other people writing in the genre? Is that is that first line extremely important to establish everything, or can you kind of gradually work into the sentiments of your book uh, over the course of maybe a paragraph or a page? I would say it's actually better to work into your uh, the sentiments of your book. Like, you don't want to beat anyone over the head with the whole plot of the book in the first sentence. <laughs> If you can do that, that's really awesome, and you should try to. But, I mean, most people who try to do that end up with a really long and fumbling sentence that doesn't really go anywhere, and we don't you can talk overdo about it on a show it. like this. Yeah, yeah you, you can overdo really it. It's easy to overdo a first sentence. But, uh, it, you again, you, all, you can't be too vague. So finding that balance somewhere between trying... that That's why I always go for mood as opposed to, like, plot necessarily. Ooh, okay, I like that. Cause that's uh, again, that's why I put the uh, pick that particular sentence because you instantly know it's romance and you're instantly interested in what the story's talking about. 
1984, that's a great example of setting the mood um, and, and even actually getting a little bit of plot, sneaking it in there, but getting it then sort of that juxtaposition. Um, I don't know, like, in, uh, here's a thought that I have that I usually tell people, um, especially when it comes to screenwriters. I always feel like the people, they waste the morning of scene. So you, you have that whole wake up in the morning and get ready for wherever it is. And it's always a great way to introduce a character, but I always feel like they mess up when they show me what the person does that isn't different. I feel like they really mm -hmm. nail the use of that trope if they show me what the person does that is different. What do you think of that? Yeah, I, I think that's very true, and that's part of just writing good good characterization. You know, it's it's so important to show what's different about a character, not only because it builds the character, but because it keeps the reader interested. And, you know, that may be something in the character's way of speaking that, that is different from everyone else. It may be something in their physical actions that's different. It may be something in the way they're living their life, like where they're living or who they're living with. But there's got to be something unusual about that character that draws the reader in and also shows something about the deeper characterization. Well, um, what else has been going on on Twitter? We'll take a quick break. Are there any other good first lines? And then I think we'll move into showing off some um, actual first lines of, of published new adult books as well. There were a couple uh, first lines that we skipped earlier. S.G. Vining says, um, and actually this is three sentences. But I know, I was going to say it's cheating, but it's really good. So go yeah, on. It's, it's, it's good. Um, she says, in quotes, Hey, babe, hand me my smokes. And the reply is, I'm not your babe, Josie replied. And then the first voice says, fine, hey, bitch, hand me my smokes. I think, I'm not sure if that would draw me in. It's interesting. I'm not sure if it's interesting enough to make me read further. Well, here's the, here's, the, here's the trick about all of these things is that do you start with dialogue or do you start with exposition? And it's like an age-old thing, and I find myself alternating back and forth. Um, Chris, do you start with dialogue, do you start with exposition, or do you kind of go with the flow based on what's happening? I mostly go with the flow because different stories can use different things. For instance, that story uh, can use dialogue very well as the first sentences because uh, it's obviously about these two characters. They're obviously important. And you instantly get, again, their mood. You understand what how this book is going to flow. When they start cussing in the first two seconds at each other, you know it's not going to be the happiest of books. So we do get a little bit of that Nene feel right off the bat, um, maybe in an upfront kind of way. Um, we do get a little bit of dialogue. It's it's interesting. Actually, what I, what I noticed the most about that was that the first voice was unattributed. And I'm wondering if... I'm wondering about that because I think that the classic trope is, of course, like all, every children's book, like middle grade reader starts off with Harry Potter, da da da. Like if you look at every single middle grade reader ever published, it starts off with the character's full name because they assume children are not going to be able to follow um, what's happening, you know, uh, and who the characters are. And then as we age up, you know, we get these sort of more vague and more vague and more vague. New adults kind of in the middle. It's between the adult and it's between the young adult. So, you know, what do you think, and Amy, I'll, I'll go to you uh, if you're back with us. Um, what do you think of the idea of an unattributed, of, of not even naming a character at the start of the book? Do you think that that is good or bad? I, I think it really, it depends on what happens next. Because in that case, you have to decide based on knowing zero about the character and just on their words if you actually want to hear anything else they have to say. So in some respects, I feel like if we're talking about the first line really setting the scene, you're risking missing that opportunity to draw people towards your character. In that case, the writer was going for a little bit of shock value, and I, I personally found it funny, and I also think it definitely goes, hi, I'm new adult. So it, it speaks so to it accomplishes, older audience. Yeah, it accomplishes a couple different tasks. Yes. Does it really draw that in? That's going to be a good question. And, and yeah, my, my initial thing was like, I wonder, I wonder, obviously if Josie's the main character, I think we could probably get away with it. Um, and it sounds like that might be the case. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting choice. When you do start with dialogue, um, it is, you know, it is sort of, uh, you're taking someone and just really dumping them. I mean, that is just right in the middle of something. Um, and in, but it can work really well, too. Yeah, I mean, in general, I love to be thrown in the middle, just, you know, smack in the middle of the scene. I have no problem catching up. It, it excites me in a way. But I think you, you have to be really careful to make sure that it's somebody people are going to want to talk to you. I think, especially when we're talking about romance, it's a little bit different when we're talking about some of the other genres, but in a case where you might have unattributed dialogue, I think it's it's usually contemporary. Uh, and you're, you're really selling everybody on loving your characters. That's the most of what you have to offer. 
you know, especially if the plot is character driven that way. So I think you want to be really sure that whatever they're saying, people are going to want to hear what they have to say next. They're going yeah, to stick around to, to find out what that's going to be. It has to be a good scene. You can't start them off and, well, I just woke up. That's yeah. not going to attract <laughs> anyone. It has to be something like evocative and immediate like that. So obviously they like in that particular uh, first sentence they're in they're in the middle of something we don't know what they're doing but the whole point is to try to figure out why they're unhappy with each other and I did like the fact that there was immediate characterizations I think yeah. that, that was very helpful mm -hmm. very important cool, is that there, there was immediate sense of character versus just dialogue just sort of random dialogue they're totally in your face so if you want that then you you really get it there if you're not sure then you're probably going to be like, all right, next. Now, <laughs> but start, I personally really like that. If you start your book like that, and then you are not a heavy on dialogue, and you're really heavy on exposition, you might be selling the wrong thing. Um, but mm -hmm. I have a feeling that the rest of that book is probably a very dialogue-heavy book, and the exposition may be a little bit more terse. And so actually, getting right, started right off the bat that way is another good sort of sales technique, because the people that are interested in that sort of style, the almost dialogue-esque style, will probably really gravitate to a first line like that. Um, like, and I've seen some really great points on first lines coming out of Twitter. Um, can you recap those for us? Yes. Um, and, and I wanted to agree with Amy, by the way. I think that that did establish a new, new adult voice, and that was important. And that was very successful. Um, there's one other first line, David, if I may, that I don't want to miss before we do the, the points. Um, EFX Scully said, growing up, this is her first line, growing up, I was taught there was no such thing as one true love, just love, never true, always free. Hmm. Um, I, I'm, you know, yeah, that definitely establishes the voice for the rest of the book, and you know right off it's going to be a romance. Um, and we made the point earlier that, you know, David made the point that it's okay that if... I would read that and go, ooh, it's a romance, because I don't like that genre. But David made the point that if you do like romance, that's going to grab you. You know, so um, you kind of run that risk, you know, when you're kind of screaming genre in your first line. Um, you kind of close that door or open that door for people, so it's something to think about. Um, What's interesting about that line to me, I just wanted to point out, is um, yeah. it sounds like a remembrance, and that's a very good yes. question, is, does, is there room for a 50 or 60 year old character to tell us a story that takes place during their 18 to 25 and is that still new adult and I'm not going to answer that I'm just going to throw that out there is that you know does the character have to be in the young adult voice in the young adult mindset or can they be recalling what happened during that time period and commentating on it or does that sort of push it toward the adult end of the spectrum and I'm just going to leave that there uh, what else what were those thoughts though they, there's some pretty good points yeah, on, on first lines coming out of yeah. Good points on first lines. Um, Lauren Kleiman says, much much appreciated for the feedback. Um, she revised that 15 times, and that was the earlier one that we were talking about with the sentence fragment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, good revisions. She, yeah, and, and she asked that um, she, she feels like that first line establishes the voice and, and that a voice needs to start strong in a book, and she wondered what people thought about that. Yeah, we actually responded to her a little bit earlier about that very point. Yeah. So Yeah. Um, EFX Scully says, never thought much about my first line. Thanks to this chat, it's just been revised. <laughs> Feel free Same. to share. We'd love to see it. <laughs> Same concept, better words. <laughs> Good job, hon. Yeah, that first line, and this is what we said last, last time and the time before, that first line is so important because if you're selling your book to a traditional publisher or an agent especially, not to mention to readers, um, that first line and first paragraph is going to either make it or break it. Uh, publishers and, and agents are very, very busy people. And if you don't catch them with that first line or two, um, they're going to put it aside and forget it. So you really want to grab them. And um, I will point out, um, the, we will talk a little bit about prologues versus chapter one. If you submit a manuscript to a publisher, the first line is the first line. It doesn't matter what you call it, the first line is the first one that they read. Um, so mm -hmm. keep that in mind when you're selling your manuscripts and, and distributing them that um, they're not going to skip the prologue. The reader <laughs> might skip the prologue, but the, the our, our agent or editor will not. Um, so point. just keep that in, keep that in mind depending on where you're putting your manuscript. Good point. Um, Lauren Kleiman also says if the first line doesn't grab me, I'm on to the next one. Mm. Um, Lauren, that shows that you have really thought about first lines, and that's probably why you wrote that one so well. Um, 
and I really liked it. <laughs> I keep going on about it, but I really liked it. Um, there was some talk about when you write the first line, and a oh, few yeah. people said that they write it after they've written the book. They go back and and write their first line. I guess I have to admit I do that too. I write um, I write the first line as I'm writing the book, but I don't worry about it too much when I'm writing the book. And then I go back to the beginning after I've written the book, and and then work on punching up that first line and first paragraph. Chris, what um, about you? Do you write the first line first, or do you revise it and leave it maybe for the end or somewhere in the process? I usually tend to go back and revise it, but I have written a few lines which is like, that's a baby. It's going to stay. Um, do you have, Are those the ones that are the nugget? Like, are so, is sometimes the first line the nugget, or do your story nuggets come in other kind of varieties, other parts of the story? I just get nuggets from all over the place. But okay. I think, like... Whenever I write a good first line, it's from a moment where I'm really passionate about the story. So that might be from the first moment. It's like, now I'm writing a great book, and we're going to start here. Or I might have written like half the book already, and I'm like, this really can sum up the whole book right at the first. So mm -hmm. it, I think it's more about what you feel is right, not necessarily when you feel is right to start the book. That's a good right. point. Amy, what about you? When do you compose the first line, the one that ends up in the final ver version? It, it goes both ways. Uh, after spending like years on the first line of a book that I was happy with but not happy with the first few paragraphs, I was given the advice to write the first line at the end, you know, to kind of go through and kind of rewrite the first ten pages after you finish the end of the book because that's when you're so deep in your writing voice. So I used that this time around and I thought that worked great. But in other cases, I've had, um, I've had, you know, first lines that just kind of come to me, and you're like, oh my gosh, that's the first line of this new thing that's been kind of percolating. And in that case, it's kind of stuck because it's kind of, it's, it's what Chris says. It, it, it grabs you. It's sort of when you're in that initial flirtation with the project, and sometimes those witty lines are, it's like flirting with the book, and they come to you really well, as opposed to when you're really into it, and it's, it's not drudgery by any chance, but you're really yeah, you, wrapped you up in know it, it. You and you don't have that fresh it. voice in the same way. You might know every single detail, and you can unravel it, which you need to do to edit it, but you don't have that like flirtatious, fun voice quite anymore. So it's really good to grab that if you can, and then just put it away until you need it to bring it back. It might not go with that first paragraph that you initially wrote. It might go somewhere else. That's actually a really great point, too. Sometimes um, you have written your first line, and you don't realize it. It just occurs in paragraph three. Yeah, and what you need to go back is sometimes in your revision process you need to kind of go back and go, oh, I started this a bit too early, you know, and and I think that that's kind of a, a discovery process as well is that sometimes you expose a little bit too much and then you find oh there's a really good nugget here and if you just literally lop off one or two paragraphs from the start of your book sometimes boom you know you're in it you're there's there's no awkwardness and it's ready to go. Um, so there's another instance where actually having an editor will really help you because if you have a really great line that's buried you know, two paragraphs down, they're going to say, here you go, this is your first sentence. Um, good job, now get rid of the rest. Right, and some of that I think is genuine warm-up, and we all need that in our writing process, and going through and editing, you want to make sure that you get any of that out. I got good advice from, uh, we were talking about getting dressed and what you want to show in that first scene, and an agent that I was speaking to, she was like, I don't want to see people getting dressed in that first scene, but if you don't get dressed, that I want to know. <laughs> exactly. It's what's different. What is different about your morning that would interest right. me? Um, yeah. Keep the. Be I, I see that the best, the best worst first lines are coming in. Keep those flowing in. Uh, we'll get some of those read out on, on air in the next segment. Um, we're gonna t go ahead and pull up some covers from. I mean, it's not the covers. Some actual first lines from some actual new adult books here in just a second. But like, in go ahead and 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 give us any more Twitter news we got to cover for the minute. Yeah, we've got we've got some great first lines coming in here. Um, the. I wanted to share the one from Gentleman's Game, um, uh, uh, my novel Gentleman's Game, because I wrote it as I sat down to write the novel and it never changed, which I think is really unusual for me. It may be the only time that happened for me. But this line occurred in italics and it was a standalone paragraph as well as a first line. And it's, Jesus, what am I doing here? And that was it. Um, I think it worked. Um, let's see. Some great first lines. Um, Deanna Roy, uh, her first, her new book says the first line is, "I had finally arrived at the first day of the rest of my life, and I was late." Oh, I love yeah. it. 
I love that. Deanna, I can't tell you how much I love that. Well, that's Deanna, the only thing I would say is I maybe maybe a dot 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 an ellipsis or an em dash. Well, maybe just a little bit of a bigger pause for for the impact of the joke to work. Um, but I love it otherwise. That also yeah. really says new adult to me. Yeah. Very yeah, true, very it, true. There's also just lots of wit to it. it yep. Yes, it, I love the joke. You already like the character. It's like, oh, you're late to life. That sucks. And, Let's keep going. Yeah, I, you know, exactly. I, I get it. I think it's a matter of personal taste, but I wouldn't I wouldn't put the dots in. I, I think it works as it is because it's so subtle and understated. And I think putting the dots in might kind of be a little too in your face, but that's a matter of personal taste. It really is, and and David has a good point too. You could do it either way. Yeah, it's just a suggestion, uh, and it will. Yeah. It, it can it could get completely over. I don't know the rest of your book, and I don't know your character at all. So that was just my thoughts. Are the joke would be? I love the joke, and I would want to personally myself emphasize it. What's our next first line? Um, I, I wanted to mention that Michael Simcoe says <laughs> says, "Man, now I want to rewrite my first two sentences and figure out how to make them into one." And and he hashtagged it grumbles. Michael, <laughs> sorry, Michael. I think I think you know, Michael. You really don't have to make your two sentences into one. <laughs> um, let's see. KK Hendon says it. Here's her first line. It had been seven hours and fourteen minutes since I completely and utterly lost my mind. That's the first line of Heart Breaths. Oh, book, the cover that we showed earlier. Yeah, I like that. I like that. I'm curious. You know, I'm curious. This is my this is my only little editorial voice. And again, I don't know anything about your book or your characters. But um, if you had completely lost your mind, that's a very exact figure. I love the sentiment. I really do. But I'm looking at it, and I, I'm now I'm actually curious because I want to know how it is that you. Lost your mind, but you let yet you know it down to the down to the, yeah. the hours and, and minutes since it happened. It, it, it's it's definitely capturing me, um, mm -hmm. but it's got a, it's, there's a lot of questions in my head as I read that, um, which could be good. Could be and good. Me, yeah, I was gonna say maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, these are from some thoughts on first lines. Um, P.K. Rizzo says personally, I don't care for it, but it won't keep me from reading on, and I'm not sure which one she meant. Um, Sara Maria says, if done well, anything can work. Hmm, I'm not sure what she means by that. Some things don't work, hon. <laughs> A. Claudie says, um, I like to drop in on action, so dialogue is fine by me. And I wanted to make a comment there. Um, literature professors at the university level, and Chris, Chris can back me up on this, I think, will tell you that to start your novel or your short story, you want to drop in on the action. That's the perfect situation. You don't want to start at the very beginning of the story or at the beginning of the day when you get out of bed. You want to start with some action. And um, the the example we had earlier with the dialogue, I think it really did that. And in that sense, it was very successful. Yeah. There was a, a quote. I forget who it's by. It might be Stephen King, but it was uh, always start as close as you can to the action as possible. So basically yeah. just a rephrasal of what you said. But uh, it, it forms of in media res, which is starting in the moment, are always, always, always good. That's why when you watch almost any Hollywood movie or like big budget novels, they almost always will start right in the middle of something. Something's going on. Like we didn't start off with Harry Potter's life in his home because that would be boring. We started off with his parents' death. Oh, that's different. So it yeah. gets you. It gets you. And there's an example involved. of a prologue that was masquerading as a first chapter too. Yes. Just, just I just got to say that since <laughs> we talked about that earlier. Yeah. L. K. Lewis says she's not sure about dialogue for the first line, but she started many chapters with it. And we had a discussion earlier about the fact that although the first line or or paragraph of the novel is the most important thing you write, um, that and the ending maybe. Um, the beginning of every paragraph, or every chapter, I'm sorry, the beginning of every chapter and the end of every chapter is very, very important too. You want to grab the reader at the end of a chapter and make them go on to open the next chapter, and you want to grab them at the beginning of a chapter. Nothing it, works quite like that, like an interrupted dialogue. Not every chapter, please don't be James Patterson, there's only one of him, but if you do use interrupted dialogue, um, you know, every couple chapters, it can be very effective at keeping the pacing moving, definitely. 
Yes. I one of the greatest compliments I've had on my writing is people people yell at me. They'll they'll write me and yell at me and say, My God, I stayed up till four in the morning and it's your fault and I have to go to you know work at six o'clock. I take that as a high compliment because it means <laughs> that my chapters are propelling people forward and that's important. Um, let's see. Uh, Deboda seventeen says um, it, it, she loves um, the first line because it gives a quick jolt to the reader. And I think she's right. And she says dialogue is what gives it that jolt, and it's pretty effective. Um, Melodic Fate says she supposes she wouldn't mind dialogue, but she'd rather not have it. Um, you know, and that's a matter of personal taste. I, I think it can be very successful as a first line. It just, um, as Chris pointed out, it just depends upon... Um, the book and, and the flavor of the book and the action, it depends upon many things, but it can be successful. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at um, a couple actual you know books that are out there in the real world right now. We'll talk about them, and then we'll get to the uh, the best, worst, first-line contests and uh, make Chris pick a winner. Haha. <laughs> okay, and what I've done is I have done this as, a, as an agent or an editor would. I have literally just pulled up the first sentence, um, and I, if it's a prologue, I've tried to keep it there so you can see it. So this one is from Finding Bliss by uh, Dinah Silver. Um, and, of course, you can see it's called the prologue. First sentence, I checked the clock before tucking the last few strands of my long auburn hair under my swim cap. Amy, thoughts? We know she's feminine, we know she's athletic, and we know she's waiting for something, so it captures you in that way. I'm bugged by long auburn hair for some reason. Chris, what do you think? Uh, I wouldn't have a problem with it. I mean, like, you, you, you can't argue with the character's design, so... Uh, I no, think... just the placement of it in the first sentence. I'm curious about it, but... Well, the the good thing about it is that it it's already starting to describe your character, and you True. know maybe so, like if it's a more emotional story, maybe someone can connect. Oh, I have auburn hair. I know exactly how this girl's going to feel. <laughs> it doesn't have to be true. It just has to connect with the person. Um, the only thing that gets me about this one is it it sounds like it was trying to say something big. But it just didn't click with me. Yeah, it feels like yeah. it's hovering in between an info dump, which I hate, and something interesting, which I love. And I don't know, like that's that's why the the long auburn hair I think is really bugging me because I think if we just got rid of that and maybe said something more interesting about the character and got to her hair color later, I, I, the hair color cannot be the most interesting thing about this character. So I'm wondering why put it up front and does the clock have more meaning? I think that was probably your thought too, right, Chris? Yeah. So it, like you you get. Uh, the situation, something with a swim cap, something's going on, and you get a clock, so, okay, maybe this is a swim match, but then you just have the character, and it's like, okay. Yeah, I just, I, yeah. I'm, I was looking, I'm looking for maybe a little bit more, and I think that's probably what was bugging me there. Let's go on to our next one here. Uh, this one is called The Arrangement, number 10. Uh, this is by H.M. Ward, and of course, if you don't know H.M. Ward, you should. Um, a, a big leader in the, in the category. So this is volume 10, um, I still, we still count it as a first sentence, but I'd be curious to see what volume one was like as well. Here we go, chapter one, so no prologue. There are many levels to the depths of Sean Farrow's anger, but holy shit, I never expected this. I like it because it has voice, but not immediately. You don't realize, it sounds like exposition, and then you get, oh crap, here we go. And it, it, that's why it hooks me, I think, because... I didn't expect it to be a person speaking. I thought it was a narrator. Yeah, that definitely kind of gets you back. And you immediately again then get first person and you immediately get that sort of intimacy of the narrated first person versus just the experienced first person. Amy, what are your thoughts? Um, I think that it's aggressive. And I think, again, it definitely speaks to the genre. It's sexy. It tells you you're reading something that's going to have bad language and you know some people that are not going to behave. So it's... That, that's definitely what these books are about, so I like that. But, I, you know, language-wise, it doesn't necessarily draw me in. It's more knowing what I'm going to come into, where it gets me. Yeah, Lycan, talk to me about the adjectives in this one. I felt a little let down, maybe. Uh, you know, I really liked it. Um, okay. And I, I think there are two reasons. Um, because it, it says something about the character... Um, f for one thing, because because of the the use of uh, the profanity, but holy shit, I never expected this. Now you already know something about the character's voice. Ooh, we got a train. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Chris, stop making a train noise. 
um, yeah, the, the, you know something about the character, and um, you also know something about what's going on in the story, and it does propel me forward because I want to know who Sean Farrow is and why they're so angry, and I I want to know more about the character that's speaking. I, as compared to the last first line, which didn't interest me in the least because I really could care less about a woman tucking hair under her swim cat, which is something that happens a hundred times a day, and checking a clock. You know what's interesting about that? But this. Um, this propels me forward. I like this. Okay, so it's good from that perspective. David, I just gave you the link to the first book in that series, which might be helpful. Um, but the first line in it is kind of benign comparatively. It just says the night air is frigid. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on. Be nice. And, you know, in some ways though, it's it's compelling of its own sort. So. Yeah, absolutely, but it's certainly a different tone. Once I, I think you know, it's a little harder to evaluate um, and the, the in the middle of, course, of a series it, is it that is, way. Yeah, is it a, is it a series where each book is independent? Is it a series where you need to know stuff? I mean, there's a lot of questions about that. This is from Breaking Nova by Jessica Sorensen, and that is a first book in a new series. So there you go. And of course, we have a. This is t labeled as a prologue. Um, and then we've got Nova, so I was, I we're talking point of view there. Um, first sentence, sometimes I wonder if there are some memories the mind doesn't want to deal with, and that if it really wants to, it can block out the images, shut down, numb the pain connected to what we saw, what we didn't want to see. Chris, what do you think? Very long. I'm not sure how I feel about the link. Yeah, I, I always say I thought it was going to be over before I was done reading it. <laughs> um, I feel like I feel like the impact got lost because of the length. Lycan, what do you think about the length? I agree. I, I think the impact was lost because of the length, and it's a real shame because I think the concept of the sentence is excellent. And like if I it wanna, could have I been written with punch. more... Yeah, I yes. want punch at the top and then give me a little bit of backup to it. Use that same concept, and if it could have been written with more punch and less rambling, I think it would have been a heck of a first line. Yeah. If there was a period, period after oh. numb the pain... Then it would be good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I agree that it's um, I agree that it's a little bit long. But what I will say from a marketing point of view is that this is a writer with a pretty big fan base, and I think it lets you know right off the bat that you're getting exactly what you want from one of her new series. And Very I know true. we can we can talk about that on both sides of the equation, whether you want to do something new each time or whether you want to give your readers what they're coming to you for. And in this case. I think that this writer does have a very specific, like, broken and beautiful kind of a brand, and I think you know you're going to get it, and that's valuable. Well, but even even though then, uh, every book needs to sell itself. I completely agree series. with you. I completely yeah. agree with you, and I'm not, I, I definitely could cut that so line it, at a few different it being, places. It being part of a series isn't an excuse for a boring first line. It's, well, boring. Quote that, it's boring. quote that, people. <laughs> This is this is the first line in a new series, so she's not selling people on this series. What I'm just suggesting is that if you do have a brand that readers are really responding to, that first line is always an opportunity to make them know that they are going to get that from you again. And in this case, that's done here. Whether or not you know, I would cut that line sooner is, is a yeah. different story. That's true. Well, here are the uh, Chris, and Chris, you got to pay attention now. Here are the submissions for the the worst first lines, the best worst first lines, um, and we're going to have you pick a winner and we'll tweet that out. So here we go, um, from Michael Simcoe. The first rule of Paranormal Romance Club is dot dot dot. Uh, from Cat Girl, uh, let me now let me go through this three-hour slideshow of my life. Um, from Devota Seventeen, it was the best of times. It was oh wait. Uh, from oh, I'm not even something deep. Sorry, Arafax deep. Yeah. Uh, I I I looked in the mirror for the first time. I realized I was dying. Okay, can I comment on that one? I'm sorry to interrupt, but. Uh, Arafax is a friend of mine. I'm editing a book for her. <laughs> and um, good job, Becky. Good job. I don't think that's a worst first line. I was going to say, I, when, I saw, good when, I saw, when I saw it come through the stream, I, I think that that's my yeah. favorite part about the contest that they actually hold for this, is that some of the first lines that get submitted and even win, I actually would think would make a great book. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, uh, another from Catgirl. Um, uh, I woke up. It was a normal day. Nothing happened. Okay. Uh, from uh, from E F E X E X Scully, it was love at first sight, and by the end of this story, you'll understand why. <laughs> um, another from from Michael Simcoe. Damn it, I'm craving blood and twinkling again. 
And from Lauren, she had the kind of smell only a mother could love. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> All right, Chris, uh, feel free to deliberate for about 30 seconds and then give us your winner. Actually, I've already decided. I'm going to give this one to Cat Girl. Uh, for I woke up, it was a normal day, nothing happened. I think that's, I think that's a completely great short story, actually, right there. Perfect. Yeah. Cross fiction. You it's have almost riveting... haiku. I haven't done the counting yet. <laughs> you got to start somewhere, and why not in the most boring way possible? I actually think that that's ironic enough that I want to be like, all right, why are you talking to me? I'm gonna let let's see yeah, what else well, you have here. That's the tricky point. It's like you try to write a bad line, you end up with actually a really good line, you know, yeah. for yeah. for a different story, a story that you didn't even know you were writing. Plot that twist. last one, that last one by Lauren, actually, I think is another really good first line. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna call Mr. E.J. Wesley to the mic as we begin to say good night because he's gonna tell us a little bit about what's happening next week. So E.J., if you can come on back for us. Yeah, I'm here. Um, What's, up, what's on tap for next week? Because it's kind Those of exciting, fan, actually. Fantastic worst lines, by the way. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> yeah, next week we are having two of our Twitter regulars, uh, Ashley Poston and um, uh, Nazara, and they're going to come back on and talk about co-authoring books with us. It should be a really cool chat. I know a lot of people are very interested in co-authoring and teaming up with other authors out there. Uh, and they're going to just tell us a little bit. of they, They're collaborating on a really big NA project, and... We're just going to touch the bases on, like, sort of, you know, what do you do when you collaborate, sort of the ins and outs, the pitfalls, that kind of stuff. So. And the teaming up of authors, I think, is probably going to become much more of a norm, especially when you've got people like Chris and Lycan and I who are also editors. Like, you're going to have a lot of service trading, I think, in the future as well as, you know, author services. Um, so it's something to consider. And there are quite a few successful writing teams. In fact, the publishing model is the one that really created this when they took big name authors and partnered them with smaller name authors to kind of give the smaller guys a boost and let the bigger guys turn out more books to sell. So, yeah, it's an interesting thing, and I'm, I'm, really, I'm actually very excited to talk to some people that have gone through it because it's, it's been an interest of mine for a little while. So we'll have that on for next week. Um, if you like the format of this week, please let EJ and, I, and, and everyone know. Uh, we do enjoy trying to talk with you guys on Twitter, and we would like to do this more often. If you have any some suggestions, I know you like covers, um, but you know, especially if you if you like the kind of interaction that you had tonight, go ahead and let us know about that. Um, thank you very much to Mr. Chris Fox for just coming back off his hiatus and joining us. Hopefully, we will encourage him to come back again sometime soon. You think maybe? Gladly. Okay, Amy. Thank you very much for coasting with me tonight. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Our hangout producer for the evening and, and voice of Twitter, voice of you guys, Ms. Lycan Craig. Lycan, thank you so much. Thanks, David. And then, of course, Mr. E.J. Wesley, the partner in crime of, of this wonderful little broadcast. So from everyone here at NA Lit Chat, we will say have a great weekend. <laughs>